before we use any of this gear, we gotta make sure that the home we're going to photograph is in good shape and it's actually photo ready. And the way we do that is by providing our client with a prep guide. And this is gonna tell them some of the things that we ask the homeowner to do. It's all just a bit of good communication between us and our client and then with our client to the actual homeowner. That said, let's just jump into the gear. I wanna show you that you really don't need a ton of gear or a huge investment to get started in this business. Basically, we need a tripod, a camera, and some lights. That's pretty much the simple formula to do uh, real estate photography. I mean, we're not talking about HDR and blending exposures here, we're talking about actually lighting the rooms. Let's start with the camera body. For real estate, doesn't matter what kind of body you're using, you can use an SLR, you can use a mirrorless camera. There's a number of options out there. It doesn't have to be the most fancy camera on the market. I'm shooting with the 5D Mark IV, which is Canon's most current flagship full frame outside of their sports and wildlife camera. A Rebel will work or one of the cheaper Nikon sort of consumer cameras will work, but you do need to have a wide angle lens. So I'm shooting with the Canon 17 to 40. That gets me the ability to shoot pretty much any room from a powder room all the way up to a master bedroom and even exteriors. Something in that range on a full frame, you know, 16 to 40 or 16 to 35. And on a crop sensor body, you want something a little bit wider, something that's a little closer to 10 millimeters on the wide end of the lens. And then there's the 10 to 20 or the 10 to 22. So camera body, not super important, but definitely you do need a wide angle lens. Outside of that, the only other lens that I usually use on a real estate shoot is a standard zoom lens. This is the Canon 24 to 105. It allows me to get across the street when I shoot exteriors so I can kind of zoom in on the home and compress things a little bit. And I think that it just fills the frame better and it gives me more options. I can shoot quite close to the home at 24 mils. And the reason that we use zoom lenses and we're not using primes or tilt shifts, I'm gonna talk about that in a moment, is because we wanna move quick and we don't wanna be swapping out lenses. That's just taking up time and we only have an hour to 90 minutes on site. So there's really no replacement for an ultra wide angle zoom lens for shooting real estate. We got to move quick. 17 to 40 is my go-to for 99% of the work. And then I do have this uh, zoom lens as well, the 24 to 105 for shooting exteriors, but I don't use this inside at all. So I will take a quick second just to address the tilt shift lens. In my day-to-day -day work uh, for design and the kind of stuff I'm doing now, I use this all the time. Probably maybe 90% of the shots I do are with this lens. Now, the reason we're not using it for real estate is that it's just not wide enough when we're shooting a small powder room or a small bedroom. And again, we don't want to be swapping out lenses. And also, this is a manual focus lens. It's got movements in it. It tilts. It shifts. It's really not the best choice when we're trying to move quickly on a shoot. So I'm going to actually not even bother packing this for the shoot, but I did want to talk about it briefly. Let's go ahead and throw our zoom lens, our medium range zoom, and our wide angle zoom and our body in the bag. So next I wanna talk about the tripod. In my opinion, the tripod is probably more important than the actual camera and lens. No one wants to spend money on a tripod. There's a million options out there for an, an $80 or $100 or a $200 tripod. I can tell you from experience that those things last six months to a year and then they're gone, you gotta replace it. So definitely you wanna spend a little bit of money up front and get a good tripod. Don't get one of those flimsy travel tripods and make sure you get one that goes high enough in case you wanna use it for exteriors and just get a higher vantage point. So something uh, you know, in the six to eight foot range, something that goes pretty high is a, probably a good bet. And you also wanna make sure you get a geared head. It gives us very fine movements so we can make sure that we get the composition we're after without the camera moving around too much. This one that I'm using is an Enduro AT413. It's an aluminum tripod. This one goes to about seven feet. It's really heavy, it's really robust. I've had this for about four years. It's never let me down. It's not the most expensive tripod out there. This total investment, you're looking right around $600, which sounds like a lot, but it's sort of a buy once, cry once kind of thing. This should last you more than four or five or 10 years if you treat it right. But spend a little bit of money, get something sturdy. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit more about the actual head. This one has twist locks on it. So there's twist locks or there's lever locks. I prefer the twist locks personally. I just find it's a little bit quicker. And I'm just gonna extend this down and talk a little bit more about uh, the head and about the adjustable center column. So we're moving pretty quickly with real estate and when we go from a bedroom where we have a certain camera height into the kitchen where we might be a little bit higher, we don't wanna be twisting those leg locks and having to adjust things too much. So uh, having an adjustable center column that can rise and fall 
gives us some really quick uh, adjustments if we want to get a, a higher vantage point or a lower vantage point. Also with the geared head, we have knobs on here that give us uh, the ability to rough in our composition. It puts it in sort of a free mode. And then once we get it close, we can actually fine tune it with these knobs. There's also a bubble level up on top so we can make sure that our verticals are straight up and down. And for architecture and design and real estate, this thing is really indispensable. This full setup is about 600 bucks. So it sounds like a lot of money, but it's really um, one of the most important things, especially because we're gonna be combining multiple frames and we can't have the camera moving. We want everything to stay nice and, and stable so that the frames all line up when we bring them into post. Let me just collapse this down and we'll get this in the bag. So I'd say that the tripod's actually probably, you know, one of the most important things. So spend some money there. So next let's talk about our lights. And this is my speed light bag. I've got eight of these guys in here and these come with me on every shoot. I just make sure that I have a few extras in there in case one falls off a door and smashes or if I forgot to charge a battery, it just gives me a little bit of a backup plan. So the flashes that I'm using are a mixture of these newer TT850s. And then there's a bunch of different rebrands for these out there from Godox and Flashpoint. The key is that this is a, a dumb speed light. It doesn't talk to the camera at all. There's no kind of metering built into it. It basically just puts out light. That's all it does. The nice thing about these speed lights over some of the other models is that they have a lithium battery pack in them. So this battery pack is, they say, good for about 600 full power flashes. We're never at full power for a full shoot, so what I can usually do is charge these on a Monday morning and they will last me most of the week. I might have to charge sort of towards the end of the week. You'll notice that this one's on a little foot, so this guy can balance on the top of door frames, I can balance it on a, a mantle, I can put it on a, a table. It gives me a number of options and it's triggered by using a little sensor in the front of this window here that will see other flashes going off. Those other flashes are triggered using radio triggers. Basically, it's a signal that comes from the camera and tells these guys to flash. It's pretty simple. These are super old. You can tell this one's actually all packing taped up. This was the first set of triggers I ever bought. I think I bought these in 2011. And these are the Yongnuo RF602s. Again, they're a stupid trigger. They don't talk to the camera at all. They're not receiving any information other than to make this flash fire. So we don't want the camera talking to the flashes at all. We want to make all the decisions. The way that I attach these to my little tripod here I'm gonna show you in a moment is this slides in, it's just a hot shoe, and then we lock it down, and then this is actually a video tripod. This is a super lightweight, I mean, I would never put a camera on top of this thing. It's, it's not very high quality, it's pretty flimsy. I think they're about 20 or 30 bucks. We're just putting our speed light on top of it. And we've twisted our speed light into this uh, trigger, and then when we get on site, it's as easy as just popping that right into the top of the tripod, and we're almost set and ready to go. You'll notice that on this one handle here, I have uh, these little eye hooks or these little eye bolts. And we're gonna show you that when we get out in the field. I slide an umbrella right through there. That allows me to quickly and easily add a modifier. Again, for real estate, we're not bringing soft boxes. We wanna try to be bouncing light whenever possible, but sometimes we do need to use an umbrella uh, to fire some light through. Now that we have our light actually up on the stand, we've got it attached to our radio trigger. The next thing we need to do is just put our actual transmitter into the hot shoe of the camera. Now this slides into the camera and every time the camera fires it just tells this guy to go off. So I can actually demonstrate that here. Let me just turn the power down and you'll see that as I press this the flash goes off. So that's the camera just telling this flash to go off. In the field usually what I do is I have two flashes up on these stands, two flashes on the little feet and then I also have one flash on the stick here that I'm gonna talk about in a moment. In addition to that, I need a way to trigger my camera. I do a lot of mobile lighting, so I'm not ever at the camera actually pressing that shutter. I use the exact same set of triggers that I use for my lights. This is the RF602. Again, these are super old. I've had these things forever. They're all taped up because I've dropped them a million times, but they're really reliable. They don't miss fire, and I can really count on these. The only difference is that I have this cable, and this cable is specific to my brand of camera and it's made by Yongnuo. I've got a bunch of backups in my bag here because these things sometimes do short out and it's so important to my workflow that if one goes down, I have to have a backup. So this is 
the LS02C3. So that is for my actual camera. If you're using a Nikon or a Sony, you might have to look up what model number is applicable to your camera. So this goes into our camera. And as I press this button, it's gonna now tell our shutter to fire. And because our shutter is firing, it's telling, this other trigger is telling our flash to go off. So I really, I cannot work without this. I need a way to fire the camera without having to be right next to it. In terms of modifiers, I don't use a whole lot other than an umbrella. We don't wanna be setting up soft boxes and other kind of crazy modifiers. We wanna move quickly and we can get a good quality of light by shooting through an umbrella. This is a 43 inch Westcott satin umbrella. It's nothing fancy, the 20 or 30 bucks online. And I carry two of these in my bag all the time. The only other modifier I carry, and it's not really even a modifier, but it sort of goes along with this, is a pack of gels. These little gels are just tiny pieces of plastic that have been cut that I put over the front of the flash, and it actually just changes the color of the light that's coming out. I find that my umbrellas give the light a bit of a cooler bluish tone, so I'll use a, a half CTO or a quarter CTO, that stands for color temperature orange, just to warm up that light a little bit, but in terms of modifiers, that's the only thing I bring are the gels and the umbrella. Let me pack some of this stuff out of the way, and we'll talk about the last piece of gear that we need to discuss. These guys all fit in here, everything fits into one bag. Okay. And the last thing I'm gonna talk about is this guy here. This is just a cheap monopod. I think this thing's 20, 30 bucks. Again, not a huge investment to get into this. This extends to about seven feet and it has a radio trigger on the end, just like our other flashes. So when that remote transmitter is talking, it's gonna to talk to this as well. What I do is I put a light on top of this monopod and it allows me to be completely mobile with my lighting. Again, I've got a way to trigger my camera now. I can move all over the room and light in different ways. So I can actually stand outside of a room and put this light actually right in and trigger the camera and I can light the room without having to actually walk in. So when I do my compositing work and I'm combining frames, I'm not having to Photoshop myself out of the scene. Oftentimes it's just a little bit of this that can be seen in the top of the frame. Another thing that being mobile and having this on a stick allows me to do is I can control the quality of the light, whether the light is hard or soft. So the closer that I hold it to the surface I'm bouncing off, the harder the light's gonna be. And again, if I hold it a little further down, it creates a softer quality of light and I can try to bounce it off a wall behind me and I can try a whole bunch of different things to get the quality of the light I'm looking for without ever actually having to be in the room. I can usually be outside of the scene. So I think that's all that we need to talk about in terms of gear. As you can tell, it's not a ton of stuff. A handful of speed lights, a camera, a monopod, and some of those little cheap light stands, and a good tripod. Remember to get a good tripod with a geared head if you can. So let's get all this stuff packed away, and we'll get over to the house and do our walkthrough. So we're on location and the home that we've been hired to shoot is just in behind me. Right now it's midday and most of the light is actually on the side of the house, which isn't ideal. We want more or less the light to be on the front of the house for that hero exterior shot. Today, because we're going to be on site for a while, we're going to pop out a little bit later on when the light's more around this side to shoot that front exterior. When we do that exterior, we want to make sure that we compose a shot that tells the story of the home and includes some of the design elements. In terms of where we're gonna shoot from, we're a little bit limited because there's a lot of trees around. It's gonna be something in this area that we're gonna end up shooting. But for now, let's jump inside and we'll do our walkthrough. Looking around this space, this is sort of like a separate formal dining room and it's just off the foyer where we walked in. The stairs lead up to the second floor here, so we're going to want to try to connect that to show that you walk in and we have this living space and then we go right upstairs. I'm thinking maybe from this side over here, I'm definitely going to want to shoot something in this direction. We only have a limited amount of time on site, so 
if there's certain rooms that I know are gonna kick my ass, I'm gonna make sure that I spend a little bit more time in there and I try to make up the time somewhere else in the home. So I'm always thinking that when I walk into the house, it's one of the first things I do. Remembering that this shoot's not so much about the decor. It's easy to get hung up on those kind of details, but we're really trying to tell the story of the home, the actual design of the home, some of the features, for example, like this cutaway through the stairs here and these cool windows, the fireplace, all that stuff. Those are all things that are staying here when the house sells. As I'm walking through, I'm also thinking about composition. What am I trying to show? Even thinking where am I going to put lights? Again, that's just sort of all in the back of my mind as I'm going through. So let's try to move through here and we'll have a look at the rest of the space. I'm noticing that it's a fully open floor plan. It's one giant space that's broken up into essentially a dining room, a living room, and then a kitchen. In a space like this, it's important to break it down or chunk it down. With the living room, what I wanna do is I wanna try to connect this space to the kitchen. How do we do that? We use visual anchors so that they know where they are. It's not a super wide shot where things are stretched out and the perspectives are all weird. The only problem with our dining room is I'm noticing this big beam is a massive design detail of this big open space. It's very in your face and it's gonna be somewhere in, down in the middle of our frame. So we have to decide whether we shoot around it or we include it. Some of the other things we gotta be careful of is with hanging fixtures. Sometimes they stack up. So we're gonna run through all that stuff in this tutorial to try to show you those best compositions, to show you how to get those hero shots. Looking at this space right now, there's a lot of cool things happening here. We have this amazing backsplash. We have these super high-end appliances. Again, this stuff's staying with the house. We're gonna make sure we capture everything. I'm just gonna explore over here a little bit. Looks like we have a powder room here as well. Just like everything in this house, I mean, I've only been in here for a few minutes looking around, but amazing design. This powder room, while it's small, it's no exception. So we have to highlight that as well. I have a really great solution to shoot these really tight bathrooms that I think you're gonna love. So let's head upstairs and have a look. What I like to do when I walk into a room like this is I like to just literally stand in every corner and then mentally compose a shot. Right now I can see the French doors that lead outside. In this scenario we have a fireplace over here. We want to try to connect the space and show how the master bathroom is attached and that's going to have to be done by shooting multiple angles. From this corner I can see some of the bed in this alcove how the bed tucks in behind and there's this wallpapered area here and I can also see the vanity in the bathroom so Smart compositions, tighter compositions, connecting the spaces, telling a nice, cohesive, tight story is what we're trying to do. So we're gonna do at least two shots in here, definitely at a minimum, and then you gotta check out this bathroom. This shower looks like some riverbed stone in the bottom there. The vanity looks like it's some kind of a reclaimed barn wood, and there's like this brush aluminum at the bottom. These homeowners worked hard to prep this house for the shoot today but of course they were using this bathroom this morning and these bottom drawers are slightly open. So again, a mental note, just push that stuff in, uh, straighten out these bath mats. That's just little tiny things that are really gonna make your photos that much better. And then your attention to detail, your client's gonna notice that stuff. One thing I will note is that we don't shoot the toilet. We can indicate maybe by composing and showing a little bit of the doorway that leads into where the toilet is over here. But the story is this bathtub, the story is the vanity. All that being said, I think we've done a pretty thorough walk through the home. We've identified where we might place some lights, a rough shot list, and then I think it's about time to get the gear going and take some shots. So let's get on it. The next shot that we're going to work on is the master bath and this thing is amazing. We've got this old clawfoot tub, we've got this 
vanity with the reclaimed barn board and it's got the two sinks and then we've got an amazing shower stall. I'm going to take as many shots as I need to show all the different elements of this bathroom. I'm going to try to do it in one shot. If not, it may take two or three. So let's try to dial in that composition and see if we can capture everything here. So I'm just going to kind of move the camera around here and have a look. As you can see on the right side of the frame, that's where the toilet is. So we're going to try to want to avoid that. And if I come out here, we're losing that second sink. And if I'm over here, we're picking up the shower, but I feel like the vanity is a little bit too extreme. It sort of starts to get a little bit too stretched out in the bottom left side. So I may just go with uh, a one point composition here. And a one point composition is when the camera sensor is parallel to the back wall and all of the lines converge to a single point. And I think for this bathroom, we could probably try to capture everything we need to show using a single point. So I'm gonna dial that in right now. And as you can see on the live view, I'm actually pulling the, the camera back into the bedroom. And what I'm gonna do is I wanna have a little bit of, of the wall just to the right side of the shower. And I'm gonna to start to zoom in a little bit. I don't need to show both sinks. I can just show an indication of the second sink and then you can fill in the blank knowing that there's a full separate sink that's on the left side here. I think something in this area feels pretty good. What I may do though is bring the camera up a little bit. The sinks actually are, are starting to really flatten out because we're sort of almost looking into the side of them. What we wanna do is actually raise the camera up and we can actually see over them. So I'm gonna try that here, see maybe if that opens things up a little bit more for us and gives those sinks sort of better shape, better indication of their size. So that's definitely better. But what happened here now is we've got a ton more ceiling. So this is where that fake tilt shift effect is gonna come in handy. We're gonna angle the camera downward a little bit and use the top corner of the frame as a hinge almost. So I'm just gonna grab the back knob of my geared head here and I'm just gonna just twist it ever so slightly and maybe somewhere around there. And again, because we're gonna be losing pixels in post, what we gotta do is we gotta back out a little bit to compensate for that crop that's gonna happen. So I'm just gonna come out just a little bit. That feels really good. We can see the full vanity. We can see obviously the clawfoot tub and then we can see that amazing shower stall over to the right side there. What I will do is I'm gonna pop in the bathroom here and I'm gonna actually crack the door of the shower just as an indication that the door opens up and then you have an entrance way into the actual stall. And while I'm in here, I'm just gonna look around and give it a once over. You'll remember during the walkthrough that we actually pushed in um, the bottom cabinets here, or the, uh, these drawers, just so that everything's level. And we did straighten out the bath mats, but what I wanna do is, I think I'm gonna pull those right out. I think that the tile floor is a little bit more important than having these mats in the shot, so I'm just gonna carefully stack these guys, and I'm just gonna pull them right underneath the bottom of the camera where we can't see them. I'm really happy with this composition. I think we're telling the full story of the bathroom. We can see a clear view into the shower. We can see one of the many shower heads that are in there. We can see the tile, we can see the floor. We know there's two vanities there. We can make out the barn board. And I think it's about time to start lighting this shot. So let's confirm focus. And then we switch back over to manual focus. Always switching back over to manual focus so the camera's not hunting. We try to put those images together. If they're out of focus, we're gonna have a problem. So next we wanna to try to determine our base exposure. And I'm just gonna rely on the meter and the camera. I'm gonna bring my exposure up to a 30th of a second and I'm gonna take a shot. It's a very sort of geometric bathroom and we have a lot of straight lines that we can reference with the tile on the bottom of the frame here and then the shower and the ceiling and everything. I think maybe this is a little bit dark and I'm actually just gonna bump the exposure up just a touch. So we're gonna to go to a 20th of a second, take another frame. The next thing I'm gonna do is just quickly flip back over to live view. And then we can begin lighting this. Right now you're gonna see how quickly this stuff can move along. 
I should be able to light this bathroom in less than 20 or 30 seconds with only a handful of frames that I need to composite into post that gets you a great image. So the first thing I wanna do, I'm gonna guess the flash power and I'm gonna to go to an eighth power. And the reason for that is it's a bright white bathroom. The lights can be bouncing around there quite a bit. So it should be a good starting point. And I'm just gonna aim it just into the corner above the camera here. And then we're gonna fire off a shot. Just with that single flash pop that we did in the corner, just to the right of the camera, I think that we got some really good color. We got some really good white balance and the overall values are good. The, the room's nice and bright, but we can definitely do better. I am noticing that the shower over here is a little bit dark and there's also shampoo bottles and that kind of stuff on the shelves here. So I'm going to remove that just so it's not in the shot. And then we're just going to aim the flash at the ceiling, take another shot. That should get us some nice directional light that looks like it's coming through that window or from that overhead fixture. And then we'll put a light in the shower and we'll see what we get. I'm going to head into the bathroom here. I'm going to be careful not to bump the tripod. We don't want that moving. And be careful not to move the shower door because when we're compositing later, we don't want that moving at all. And because this is a white shower, I'm going to actually have the power down quite low. I'm at 1 16th and I'm going to place it just on top of one of the shower heads and the shampoo bottles. I'm just going to move right across to the other side of the shower where we can't see them. And this is something we do all the time. Okay. All right. So once again, that flash that's in the shower has an optical trigger in it and it's going to be seeing this light going off and it will go, it will fire at the same time. So I'm actually going to do the exact same shot I did before. I've added a light, so I want to try to get it established a baseline. And I'm just going to go into the top corner here of the room one more time. The shower definitely got brighter. The overall exposure is looking really, really good. And all we want to do now is flash the ceiling just to create a little bit of directionality. You should see some better shape on the sinks and a little bit of better shape around the tub. We should get a nice shadow underneath it. And let's give that a shot and see what we get. I'm not changing flash power for this at all. It's still at uh, an eighth power. And we're just going to hit the ceiling here. Definitely too bright, but we do see that we get a nice contrasting edge here where we have light and dark meeting. So it's giving us a really nice shape. We've got some shadow under the tub here. All I've got to do is just come down on my power a little bit. So I'm going to come down to uh, just below an eighth. I'm not having to enter the room at all. Everything's being done from behind the camera. It's flashing the corner, flashing the middle of the room, and then combining those two frames in post. And we're not having to wander around hiding lights. We're not having to set up any kind of modifier. So this stuff moves really quickly. And this is a great example of the composition is really nice, but the one point, I think this one's gonna to come together really well in post. I think it's time to move on to the next shot.